What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing? Woo! I would love to sound more excited, but I'm really tired. Who else is tired? No. Yeah. Who, all, who all went to the con? Woo! Who all went both days? Yeah. Anybody from out of state? Yeah. Who came the farthest? Put your hand down, CJ. <laughs> Nobody, nobody came the farthest, like, out of town. I came from Enid. Um, all right, so we're going to get started with the movie here in a bit, but we're going to do a quick Q&A with CJ. So first off, everybody give him a hand. He, like, did this out of the goodness of his heart. If you, got, if you didn't meet him this weekend, this guy is so, like, the nice guy that you see at the table, like, that's that's who he actually is. We gave him a call on Friday, and he was like, yeah, of course, what do you guys need? So we appreciate it. We appreciate him. Appreciate him being here and doing this for us. Um, so I'm just going to ask a couple questions, and I'm going to turn it over to everybody else. Um, so, CJ, what is your favorite memory of filming the movie, would you say? Because I did some porn too. Okay. <laughs> well, then we know the favorite oh, memory from that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, the favorite for me will always be the first scene. Uh, never stepping onto a set or doing a stunt in my life until I did Friday the 13th. And I'll say that again never stepping on a set or doing a stunt or even going to stunt school. The scene where Jason walks in the profile, you see the motorhome behind shaking, he turns and looks and he tilts the head and goes towards it. That'll always be my favorite because that's the very first scene that I did in an actual Screen Actors Guild film. It was wonderful. That's great. Um, how do you feel about Tom now? Tom who? Tom Matthews. Oh, he called you some very, very you know, good things. Tom's supposed to be here. I thought he was going to come hang out with us. Then he found out today that he must have missed the communication line that he, his flight left at five. So. I, I see Tom on a regular basis. I know Tom and his wife Carla, they're uh, associates and friends. He and I do shows periodically, we have some fun. If the show allows us to do photos, we put wardrobe on. I put the full wardrobe and do photos with the fans, and Tom throws on his jacket, and we put you in the middle. And uh, you know, we grab you, throw you around a little bit, and we make you sign a waiver, uh, and we have a little fun with you. So Tom's a great guy, I've known him ever since the movie, obviously, but we've become closer over time. You know, Tom Matthews, Tom McLaughlin, the writer director, Darcy. Uh, it's kind of nice to see them on the circuit. Anybody want some kind of photo up like that in the future here? Hell yeah! yeah. yeah. I'm going to set that up. Uh, I'm going to take it out to the audience because my voice is like half gone, so if we do this much longer with me, it's going to be completely. So, questions for him? Oh my goodness, okay. We're going to start right up here. From the Kansas boys, right here. So, what is it? you think that makes Jason such an iconic character that survived for, what, close to 40 years? What makes him such a timeless movie monster? So here's a question back to answer your question. How old are you? 38. So you were barely out of diapers when this movie came out that I did. I mean, I mean that respectfully. So the iconic nature going back to 1980 all the way through the last one, which was 09, I think luck. You've got to have a little bit of luck. And I think the simplicity of the film. You know, I, I listen, I love Fast and Furious. I think it's kind of cool. Transformers kind of cool. But the thing is, how many times can you jump out of a plane without a parachute, land on a tank, pick up a 50 cal, blow everybody away, and then stop and go, nice. <laughs> it's cool. It looks good. It's got the cinematic role to it. But Jason, for those of you that you know live in your apartment and you look out the window when there's some guy in a mask, or you have a home and you go around the bushes and just standing there, that figure, that's kind of for real. You know? And for those of you that have done wardrobe, uh, be it Jason or whoever, you ever notice that when you put that wardrobe on and you put that mask on, or I don't care if you're Superman, Batman, don't say Michael Myers, but anybody <laughs> else, you ever notice how you change? Your whole formula changes. All of a sudden, you may have a, lim a limited amount of confidence, but all of a sudden, you are seriously a badass. And it's just the way it is when you put that on. For me, I put that mask on, and you know, give or take 6'3", 250, I was like, there. <laughs> so, but it's a good question. All right, who else? I can tell if there's a phone ringing. I'm going to work my way back and go this way. 
Jo, det. Did being in the military help you with uh, Jason's movements? Uh, the question, did Jason's movements, the military cross paths? Yeah, they did. Um, I'd only been on the military. Um, I've been, I was in the military 49 years ago, <laughs> before a lot of you were born. And, you know, when you walk 30 inches all around the U.S. militaries, and it's a, it's a natural migration when you're marching as a soldier. So, two things. If you've ever put a hockey mask on or something and wore a mask, you know your peripheral vision is gone. All you see is forward, straight. So when you pick up that foot and put it down, you want to make sure it goes down solid so that you don't go down. It's going to be embarrassing to see Jason fall down over his own big boots. <laughs> so with that being said, yeah, you know, I mean, I still stand up straight, pull my shoulders back, and walk with an authoritative figure, but it's more just for me, I'm comfortable walking just sound straight. Even when I sit here, I sit up as straight as I can. It's just natural. So yes, it did. Uh, who's next? Awesome. The other side of the room. I love you guys. I haven't walked around this week in time. Keep up. Anybody from the parking lot have a question? <laughs> what was your favorite? Um, yeah, what was your favorite kill to, to play? Favorite kill? My yeah. favorite kill was the sheriff. There's no blood, no guts, just pure power. Going back to the simplicity of the movie and not all this green screen and this and that. Can you imagine take somebody and turn them in half and break them like a, a bone from a turkey? I mean, how cool is that? I'm glad you didn't ask the other question. He was going to ask you what your favorite Halloween movie was. Uh, I, I'm curious. The uh, yeah, put the was, light on this asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious. You did the Rolling Stone cover, but it didn't. If I'm not mistaken, it never really saw the light of day, except for pictures online and stuff like that. But how was that? How cool was that to to be up there with the other icons of horror and to know that you're now one of those icons of horror standing there. Well, for those of you to bring you up to date, back in 86, we, myself, uh, Robert England, and Bob Elmore from uh, part two of Leatherface, we did a photo op in full wardrobe with the Hollywood sign behind us, which was going to be a cover of Rolling Stone that never materialized. Some of us, like myself, still have some of those photos that we scored uh, after the shot, and I have some on my table, and it's got the three. But part of the question you can't answer because we had no idea back then the iconic nature that was going to develop over three decades. So if you had asked me then, I went, hey, I really don't know. And even today, it's like, wow. I go back to where lucky. You just sometimes get a home run, and sometimes you strike out. Right in the middle. Awesome. We're looking all the way. We're just going to throw that. So I had boomer parents that took me to see horror movies way too young. I actually went and saw this at the theater at the age of nine when it came out. Um, and it scared me to death. And one of the things I keep on, because I love the old, like Friday 13 said, that's to me horror. And I find difficulty finding things now that give me that same level of scare, that same jump. What do you find that does that for you now? Because that's something that I'm always like, I can all, only see Saw so many times. I mean, come on. So that's I'm I'm always looking for that that uh, what I felt like with those movies. So I, I think my opinion and my opinion is like an ass. Everybody has one, right? I think you gotta kind of go back sometimes to the basics. So I'm a I'm a horror fan of Universal, Black and White, Horace Call Up, Mom Cheney, that type. Sometimes you need to go back and watch those to appreciate what's come out today. But going back to the simplicity of those and back in the 80s, that's the part that's suspicious because you kind of go, wow. When you realize that something could really, really happen or materialize like that, that's freaky. But there are some things when Saw starts coming out, Terrifier, they're looking at doing part three already. Um, I hope the same success over the decades that we've had. You don't know, going back to this question over here, he got lucky, and all of a sudden, at the time, had no idea on the cover of Rolling Stones that the three of us would become iconic. You had just no idea. So you just never know where the road's going to lead to. Um, but again, if you go back to the basics and start watching them, 
your appreciation grows for each thing that you see. Um, I just hope they keep it to a minimum. And I'm not a big fan, personally, of Alien, Predator, Jason versus, you know, Freddy. It's, to me, if the character can't hold uh, the film themselves, then maybe you might want to retire it. So, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So did uh, Tom McLaughlin have you watch like classic Frankenstein or maybe even zombie movies to get you into the role of undead Jason? No, actually Tom McLaughlin, who was a big Universal Horror fan uh, at the time and still is, uh, we just had that mutual connection. We really appreciate the old school. Tom did part six, and for those of you who think about it, it's right in the middle of the series. And it was meant to be a launching platform after the less than luxurious re uh, response to part five. Uh, a lot of people like part four with Ted White. So Tom went ahead and brought that forth. He wanted to put a little bit of humor into it. Uh, Frank Mancuso Jr. of Paramount Studios said, you can't make fun of Jason, but you can do a little this and that. And that's why you got some of the, the, the kids in there was a rarity. Um, you got the little girl starts praying when Jason looks at her. You got the kids that jump underneath the uh, the bump and said, so what were you going to be when you grew up, <laughs> right? And that kind of throws that edge into it. But Tom had that same thing. He did not want a robot. Tom did not want a zombie Jason. But the mythology that the dots were being connected as the movie continued, that thinking, you know, more and more about what he was doing so that he would really become more creative than just a zombie walking around. So I'll tell you an interesting story to think back off that. When I mentioned the little girl who was in the bunk, the little blonde girl started praying. About a year ago, I got a call from Tom McLaughlin, the writer director. That young lady who's in her 40s now contacted Tom McLaughlin. Her six-year-old boy wanted a Jason mask. He didn't want one from Target. He wanted one like the movie. So Tom called me, and I had just the ones that I have on my table. I autographed and sent it to Tom. Tom autographed it and sent it back to her. So talk about generationally, things pop up. That little girl was a six-year-old who wanted a, a hockey mask with Jason. It's kind of cool. Hey, CJ. Welcome to Oklahoma. My question is along the same lines. What was the auditioning process like? Were you a previously, were you an actor before you were cast for this role? No. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the, I was running nightclubs in Los Angeles, and I was running a club. You know, good 15,000 square foot, big club, 1,800 people on a Friday or a Saturday night. I had a hypnotist on Thursday nights who would come in and do a show on stage. And we'd get her usually around three to 400 people to watch the show. The subjects would go on here. The hypnotist brought in a company called Real Effects, R-E-E-L, Real Effects, who was going to do a production for him and put it on video so that he could promote himself. They had an idea that we do a screen like behind you, and they take Ted White's wardrobe and put CJ Big Ass in it. But when I say the rest is history, the rest is. I came through the screen, and those folks in the production company kept saying, we're gonna cast you for Jason, we're gonna cast you for Jason. Now, I'm not an actor, I'm not a stunt guy, I've never been to class. You know, I went down in the military a few years, so I just kinda like, you know, whatever. However, a few months later, I got a call to go meet Frank Mancuso. I met Tom McLaughlin, and Frank Mancuso, and Michael Nomad, stunt coordinator. I didn't get the part, for clarification. So the gentleman that got the part, if you remember the paintball scene when the guy gets shot in the tummy, Jason? You ever wonder why he's a little thicker than me? Some of you may think, well, I was wearing patty. No, he's a little thicker than me. That's all I'm gonna do. When that first shot came back, which is called a daily, Management really wasn't, that wasn't what they were looking for in the image of Jason. So on a Friday I got a call, and by Tuesday I was back in Covington, Georgia, finishing out the rest of the film. But when you see that, most people think, oh, he's wearing padding, because he ain't quite that big. He's, it just wasn't me, and it just didn't meet the expectations. Now, that person, from what I've been told, went on to be a director and a stunt coordinator and many other things, so they have sure no hardship about it, but again, uh, at the time, going back to luck, I was the second choice. Doing the stunts, I'd never done them in my life. I'd never been underwater 20 feet, breathing off regulators, going through walls, windows, being set on fire, yada, yada. It was all new to me. Uh, but I was young, late 20s, cocky, like today. 
Uh, and I just kind of got a panic and did all this. I just, you know, and I was very fortunate. My stunt coordinator kept me alive, of course, obviously, and he did a great job. So sometimes success happens, and here we're talking about it three decades later, right? Yep. So how much trouble in the streets of Oklahoma City last night did you and Warrington get into? <laughs> Well, see, I'm smart. I take the fifth. Now, Warrington will videotape everything and put it on the internet. All right? You all know Warrington, my brother? I, I, I love him, but you know you got that one family matter you can't pick but you're stuck with? Warrington. <laughs> right? And I can tell you right now, he always has to give somebody $500 in case he gets locked up to get him out. <laughs> me, I was a good boy. I was in debt by love. <laughs> Anybody else? Of course, all the way at the front. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Guys, hum a song while I get there. The question is, was there any truth that I turned down Freddie versus Jason because it was a discrepancy between me and Hodder, so to speak? Um, I was, so let's go into the granular details of it. Technically, I was scheduled to be part seven. He already knows that. But what happened was, uh, Frank said, why don't we use CJ? He did a fine job. It's all great. Do it again. Kane was good friends with John, the writer-director. Kane had to go to John because Kane is a huge poor fan. And explain to John that he really wanted the role. John then had to go to Frank Mancuso to make the change. So Kane picked up part seven as a result. Now, animosity to tell him about because he's been a great ambassador for Friday the 13th. I could have never done everything he's done every week going out there and, and hanging out and talking to you guys. I mean, for 25 years, I ran casino resorts, you know, but what he's done has just been huge when you go on his coattail. When Freddie versus uh, Jason was looked at, Freddie's, there was management that called me to see if I was interested in resurrecting Jason. Uh, yeah, I felt bad for Kenny because he was pretty excited about it, but I also said, well, Kenny's got it. But I was the chief operating officer, general manager of two casino resorts, 2,300 employees, give or take. Uh, it wasn't financially making sense to put a job of that magnitude to go make a quick 80 grand, 100 grand maybe, and do a film and be an employee. So it really wasn't logical. It wasn't really, didn't take much to say no thank you. But I was honored that they had contacted me of interest of doing it. Any other hands? that are near me and on the <laughs> other side of the room. Where's that guy with the purple Halloween shirt on? Yeah. Where's your question? Yeah. What was it? Oh, it was his question, but yeah, what, you know, he, he wanted to know what your favorite Halloween movie was. Yeah. What a dumb shit. Right. Where's that other guy with the Halloween shirt on? There's one of you out there, the black shirt. Where are you? You made the guy. Don't be... Come on, man. Up here. You got any questions up there, Hammer? <laughs> I see your hand. Put it down. No? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, guys. What branch of military were you in? Army. Awesome. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. So, you know, just so you know, I know we're going to run this down. I know you guys are going to watch the movie. I'm not going to say for the entire movie. Uh, no good excuse, but still a bad excuse. I got to get up around four ish to get a five o'clock pickup. Somebody's going to pick me up, right? I'm not doing it. Well, somebody, right? I'm going to put this on out there so I don't get left behind, right? <laughs> somebody's going to call, be at the front gate to get me the hotel, from the hotel. He's over. asking for rides, everybody. Yeah, I want to make sure I get over there. But I want to make sure you, you all know this the film. Um, I really appreciate you guys. I mean that sincerely. Without you, the franchise would not be what it is today, even with the hiatus of the last 13 ish years that you're still loyal to the franchise. I'm hoping that in time they get it together and put it together. We all know there's been some challenges between Mr. Miller and Mr. Cunningham, and I, I respect both sides of the line, um, but the only reason we have an argument is because of you. If you didn't care about the film, they wouldn't have something to argue about, right? Sometimes you gotta step back and remember where you came from, So, and I appreciate where I started. So we couldn't do this without you. Kane has done a great job, you know, when you see Kane, I always tell people, make sure you tell him he's the best, because if not, you know, i got to take him to therapy on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
and you know, you can tell him I said that. It's okay. He, he loves me. Right? I'll do a show with Kane, and I'll hear the BJ, you asshole, from across. Well, Kane has a tendency to come an hour after the show starts. I'm there, you know, 15 till, next military. And after a while, you know, I'll go over there and even sign some of my pictures and put them into his. <laughs> yeah, he mother asks me every once in a while. But point is a lover, just so you know. I mean that with love and respect, so don't misconstrue what I'm saying. But all of us, you know, including the other actors, Tom Matthews and the people that have been there, it's kind of interesting when you take a look going back to your question about the horror movies is you start looking back at the old ones, Leprechaun, et cetera, there's always one or two people you go, wow, I didn't know that Pirates of the Caribbean, Johnny was in it. I didn't know that, you know, stars from each movie kind of go back and a lot of people have started their careers in horror movies. A lot of them are still in them. Look at Jamie Lee Curtis. You know, I mean, honestly, it's a pivot of her life that she was fortunate enough to be in horror movies. <laughs> so, but with that, I'm going to leave you with any, anybody, one more question, anybody got anything before I, I, I close down, because I want to make sure you all satisfied and have a great night and enjoy the film. Anything else? What do you Ooh. think of Oklahoma? Oklahoma? Yeah. It's beautiful. I'm from Montana. Uh, CJ, one last question. I got horses, alpacas, bees. These are cowboy boots. If you go real close, you'll see shit on the bottom of the horse. <laughs> so I got my, and my sister-in-law lives here for many years, my wife's uh, sister. So when you all that came by my table, the young man worked with me, my nephew, he's 36, he's a uh, master chief in the Air Force. So he was helping me this weekend on my table, the young man. So, but guys, just so you know, I mean this sincerely. Thank you so very, very much for coming to the show, the convention, uh, Oklahoma HorrorCon, great success in my opinion. They were wonderful to us as talent, and we appreciate you coming out to the show. I hope to see you next year. Uh, if I, I don't really come every year, but I'll try to come the following year if I get invited. Um, hint, hint. If I get invited. But I want to make sure that y'all know that we couldn't do this without you. Um, so safe travels. Enjoy the film. Have some fun. And eat some popcorn. <laughs>